Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to worship here at Westminster Presbyterian Church. If you are a visitor or new among us, thanks for being here. I realize it can be a challenge to get out of bed and come to a new church, and this feels like a new thing. We'll try to be nice to you along the way. Um, if you are new, I invite you after the service. Uh, we, at both exits, we will have a host or hostess who can give you a little goodie bag of information about the church and a gift for you. Be sure to pick that up. For all of us, whether we're um, brand new or been here since this building was built, I invite you to fill out the connection card in your bulletin. Uh, fill it out. For every new one of these we receive completed, we make a donation to our mission of the month, which is the, we're in May, Family Nurturing Center this month. Um, and uh, yeah, pop that in the offering as it comes by. And the ushers have asked me to remind everyone there's no need to fold it. It goes right in. Um, today is Mother's Day, so thanks for everyone who is a mother, either a biological mother or who has mothered other people in, in discipling others along the way. Thank you. So we ought to at least appreciate you maybe once a year, right? Um, and in honor of Mother's Day, I found an adorable video. And I know we don't do a whole lot of videos in the traditional service, but guys, you just got to see this one. Uh, so in honor of Mother's Day, we'll have the Mother's Day video. Oh, assuming the tech works. I think that last little girl was my daughter. I don't know when she did the video, but. 
Well, friends, there are an awful lot of great announcements in the green sheets. I'm not going to read them to you. I trust you can read. I will remind you that this is Mission May. So for this whole month of May, we have a, um, a mission theme. Next week is the mission fair, which is going on in the gathering place about various different ways you can get involved in local and global missions. On two weeks from today is Pentecost, the birthday of the church. There is a special event planned for that day. You'll see a couple of posters around, but it's a secret, so you'll have to wait for it. And on the 31st, we're going to have special missionary speakers. In this service, it'll be someone from International Justice Mission talking about their great work to do God's justice all around the world. It's an exciting time. Let's open this worship service with prayer. And please be nice and let people in. <laughs> Let's pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks. We give you praise. We praise you for who you are and for what you have done. Truly, you are a creator God. You are one who has nurtured us. You are one who has guided us and taught us of grace and love and peace and forgiveness and all those things on that Mother's Day video. Lord, may we reflect the love that you have shown us. May we grow in that love as we study your word. May we reflect it back to you and may we reflect it to the world. For we pray in the name of Jesus, amen. Well, I should, I should say one other thing. We are still in this sermon series right now, uh, talking about final things, you know, looking into the future. And I realize it's Mother's Day, and today is the sermon we're talking about final judgment. And I was trying to put together Mother's Day and final judgment and fit those together, and I just couldn't do it. <laughs> so you won't hear Mother's Day in the sermon, but you will see this theme of judgment throughout uh, the service today. join together in our call to worship. You can find the words printed in your order of worship in the bulletin. I invite you to stand and to share in it together. There is still seating in the very front rows down here too, just as a reminder. From Psalm 9, the Lord reigns forever. He has established his throne for judgment. He will judge the world in righteousness. He will govern the The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed. He does not ignore the cry of the afflicted. So those who know your name will trust in you. For you, O Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Let us join together in singing hymn number 306, Lo, He Comes with Clouds Descending.
So normally at this time of the service, we have a prayer of confession, but we are in the season of Easter, the season of resurrection. So instead, we have a celebration of the resurrection. This one is from 1 John chapter 4. Let's read together this great good news. This is how God showed his love among us. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him and he in God. We know that we live in Him and He in us because He has given us of His Spirit. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. We love because God first loved us. Amen. preschool and elementary age children, if there are any here, are welcome to uh, leave for Children's Church at this time. We will have a volunteer in the back who will take them um, over to where the Children's Church activities are, if parents would like to do that. As we prepare our hearts for our time of congregational prayer, we invite you to turn to number 268, Jesus, Thy Blood and Righteousness. We will remain seated as we sing.
Let us come to God in prayer. O oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter in the stormy blast, and our eternal home. God, on this day, we do pray a special blessing on the mothers of this church family. Strengthen them by your spirit, O oh God. For those who have children at home, give them your grace and an abundance of your wisdom. Give them strength for the day to day and a deep and compassionate love. For mothers of adult children, give them the wisdom to know what to say and how to say it. God, encourage all who are mothers and all who nurture others as they seek to pass on the faith to the next generation. And God, because we are not perfect, give all mothers the courage and humility to acknowledge our faults and to seek forgiveness where needed. Help us to forgive ourselves too, as we have already been forgiven by you. God, for those who long for children or grandchildren, Fill them with your peace and love. For those whose mothers were not what they needed them to be, God, be their perfect parent. Be their guide and wisdom. Be their comfort and strength. On this day, God, be in a special way with those in our church family who are undergoing treatments for cancer, or dealing with life-threatening illnesses. Be with those who have welcomed new babies into their families or who have received good news about health concerns. Be with those in our church family who are grieving the death of a loved one, the end of a marriage, or broken relationships. Make your presence known in a real way to those who are facing unemployment, job transitions, or changes in living arrangements. God, in all of the seasons of life, enable us, through your Holy Spirit, to be the primary evidence of the flourishing love, grace, and truth that is found in Jesus Christ alone. God, we continue to pray for the people of Nepal on this day, for your peace and hope in the midst of extreme devastation. We pray for all those who are seeking to give care, relief, and aid. Bring comfort and medical help to those who need it, and bring it soon. God, we thank you for the freedom to gather in this place and on this day. Be with our Christian brothers and sisters around the world who do not enjoy this freedom. Keep their faith strong in the midst of persecution and their hope in you. Holy God, you call us to be your children. You claim us as sons and daughters. And so as your children, we pray the prayer that your son taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Well, friends, we are continuing this sermon series looking into eternity, a hope-filled glimpse at resurrection and final judgment and the kingdom of God. And today we come up to the point where we're talking about final judgment. Now, I realize for a whole lot of people that sounds scary. Today, I hope to convince you from the word of God that we should not be scared but overjoyed at the thought of final judgment. The only thing scary has been some of the lousy preaching about final judgment over the last several hundred years. And I apologize for that. It wasn't me, but I apologize anyway because it was people who looked like me standing up in front of people with microphones. Uh, You have some of these hellfire and brimstone preachers who are trying to scare, scare the hell out of people or scare the people out of hell, one or the other, right? And you have these people who will tell you, you know, turn or burn. Well, here's the thing, friends. The New Testament never speaks that way about final judgment or hell either for that matter. The, when, when the New Testament talks about the day of the Lord, it is anticipated with joy. Um, in fact, when Jesus talks about it, when Paul talks about it, when Peter talks about it, when Revelation talks about it, the one word that is most frequently connected with final judgment is the word reward. Final judgment is, should really should be called final justice. It is a time when good will be rewarded, when evil will be brought to justice, when sin will be eradicated, when death will be killed. It is a time when any evil or darkness of themselves are thrown into hell and the cosmos will be restored forever. That's what final judgment is about. It is good news. Now, 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 I do have to admit that when you, that's, that's in the New Testament. When you look in the Old Testament, there is some scary talk. All right, we, we have to be honest about that. In Malachi, the very last book of the Old Testament, um, talks about final, just, final judgment. And Malachi 3, he says, uh, the Lord is coming, but who can endure the day of his coming? It will be like a refiner's fire or like a launderer's soap. The, the reason is, the context of Malachi, people were so looking forward to final judgment because they knew it would mean judgment on their enemies. Malachi had to tone it down and remind them, okay, we're all sinners too, people. But even then, he says, the purpose of final judgment is refining to make us, to make the universe like pure gold, like pure silver. It's wash day for the universe. It's like a launderer's soap. Let's look at what the Bible says about final judgment and try to put aside all of those sinners in the hands of an angry God sermons you may have heard or think you've heard over the years. Let's look at what God says in his word. Uh, I'm going to be in Revelation chapter 20. Um, There are several different images of final judgment in the Bible in the New Testament. Uh, This is one of them. This is John's vision. Um, Here it is. I'm going to chapter 20 verse 11. Then I saw, this is a vision of John, I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his, this is God, from his presence, earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, so in this text, you see final judgment actually has two phases. All right? You come on in, find a, find a seat. We're a little tight today. Uh, it has two different phases. There's what I'll call the justice phase and the grace phase. Right, Because you have books that are opened on people's lives and people are judged according to what they had done that's in the books. Right? That's the justice phase. And then the book of life is opened. 
And people who are in the book of life are welcome into the eternal kingdom of God. That's the grace phase. Starting with the justice phase. In the justice phase, everyone is judged by what's in the books. And I know a lot of people are scared of that. Oh my goodness, every sin I've ever done is going to be written in those books. Where on earth do you get that? I didn't say that. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. In fact, the only place in the whole Bible that talks about a list of sins is in Colossians 2.14. And it says that God took the list of charges that stood against us. He took it away and nailed it to the cross. It's the only place in the Bible that talks about a list of sins. I have an artwork in my office about that. It is a beautiful piece. You can see it after church. But that's the only thing that talks about a list of sins. That doesn't say that here for this list of books. It's not a list of our sins. We don't know exactly what it is. Maybe, most likely, it's a biography. A biography of your life. And I know to some people that sounds a little bit scary because we all have parts of our lives we'd rather not make public, right? Well, maybe some of you do and some of you don't, apparently. (laughs) I do. There are some parts of our lives that would be a little embarrassing or a lot embarrassing if it was just shown to everybody, but God knows those parts anyway. But aren't there parts of your life you'd love to show the world? Wouldn't you love to see a biography of your life that really shows all of your joys and all of your triumphs and all of your accomplishments? Wouldn't, it, wouldn't there be some part of you that would be willing to have your head held high to see a biography of your life? Maybe I should say it this way. Live in such a way that you could hold your head high when a biography of your life is read. Of course, we don't know that it'll be a biography. Maybe it'll be something different. Maybe instead of a biography of the way you have lived, maybe it could be a biography of the way God intended for you to live. A biography of the life God intended for you to have without sin. What your life would have been like, what your relationships would have been like, what your whole story would have been without sin in your life. And then you could see the distance between that life God had for you and the life we actually lead. You see, that distance is the cost of sin. Sin costs us. Sin hurts us. It hurts other people too. That's why it's sin, right? If God showed you the life that he wanted for you, you would see the cost of what that sin has done in your life. What if God does it that way? We don't know what's in the books, but we do know that we will be rewarded according to what we've done. As I said before, the most common word associated with judgment is reward. Uh, Jesus talks about this over and over again in Matthew 16, 27. For the Son of Man will come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what he has done. In fact, Jesus speaks of rewarding people at final judgment 16 times. 16 times. Jesus talks of rewarding people at final judgment. Revelation 22, 17, one of the very last verses of the Bible. Jesus says, Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me. Now, recompense is one of those words that can go either way. right? It means rewarding the good and it means punishing the bad. And isn't that good news too? Because Final judgment is a day of justice. On earth, there's not always justice. Sometimes criminals get away with it. Sometimes terrorists and tyrants and slaveholders get away with it. Recently, I was reading something on human trafficking where there are some people who would, uh, they kidnap children and then pimp them out as prostitutes. That is just wrong. It is just evil. And sometimes they get away with it on earth but not forever. One day, there will be justice. There will be total and complete justice. Isn't that good news? Plus our reward for the kingdom work we've done on this earth. Final judgment, final justice is good news, people. Jesus told parable after parable of of, of the king coming back to reward his servants. And when you see the rewards that most of the servants get, they are richly rewarded, extravagantly rewarded. 
And yes, in every one of those parables, there's that other guy, the unfaithful servant who gets punished instead of rewarded. Well, don't be that guy, right? Don't be an unfaithful servant, but don't miss the point that final judgment is a time of reward, and the rewards are extravagant. Being scared of final judgment is like a kid being scared of Christmas because he might get coal in his stocking. We've all been a little bit naughty. Yes, it's true. But we don't end up with coal in our stockings because our Father loves us. Don't miss the point. Final judgment, the justice phase, is a time for good to be rewarded and evil to be brought to justice. Praise the Lord, it's good news. After the justice phase, after those books are gone through, then out comes the book, the book of life. It is the grace phase of final judgment. And they bring out the book of life. Those whose names are in it are resurrected into God's eternal kingdom, and those whose names are not in it are cast into hell, into the lake of fire created for Satan and his angels, which verse 14 calls the second death. And as Lori preached two weeks ago, uh, you know, different biblical passages have different images. Some have the image of eternal punishment, which sounds like people will be conscious. Others talk about destruction. It's just a second death. They just die again. Either way, that's the scary part, right? That's the part that I don't want to be around for, right? Um, and it would be scary except for the fact that God is the one who's in charge. People who are scared of final judgment are scared because they don't have the right understanding, the right image of their mind of God, of who He is. Some people think, seem to think of God as a Santa Claus, sort of a soft, cuddly teddy bear, and then they ask, well, how could there ever be final judgment? Look, God isn't soft. God is a God of justice. When he sees these human traffickers, when he sees terrorists, he knows that is wrong. When he sees the sin in our lives, he knows the hurt it causes us and other people. He knows that. He's not soft. On the other hand, some people think of God as just hard. Some people have this image in their head that, that final judgment, you get put on a scale, and if you're over your limit of sin, you get cast into hell. That image is nowhere in Scripture. In fact, the image of a scale. I was trying to figure out where that came from. It's in medieval art. It may have been pre-Christian in, in, in Europe. I don't know where it came from. I could not find a source. It may be pagan mythology. It's nowhere in the Bible, this idea of a scale of final judgment. It's just not the way the Bible talks. Some people seem to think God is like a guy picking cherries out at a grocery store. Okay, I like that one, I like that one, and the rest of them can just rot. No. Is that the God we know? Is that the God who created this world out of love and said it's very good? Is that the God who even after we sinned, after we rebelled, he called Abraham's family. He called them, blessed them to be a blessing, to have a plan for the salvation of the world. Is that the God who even after Abraham's family Messed up, he forgave them and he restored them again and again and again. This cherry-picking God, this God with the scales, is that the God who, in Isaiah the prophet, said, I have created you, I have formed you, do not be afraid, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. Is that the God who gave up the comforts of heaven and came in the person of Jesus Christ to restore us, to forgive us, to bring us back to God. Jesus, who was willing to be tortured to death so his enemies could be forgiven. Is that the God of final judgment? Yes. I know a God who desires that all people shall be saved to come to a knowledge of the truth. That's 1 Timothy 2.4. I know a God who does not wish that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's 2 Peter 3, 9. I know a God who so loves the world that he sent his one and only son so that whosoever believes in him will not perish but has everlasting life. That's the God I know. 
That's the God who's in charge of final judgment, a God who is desperate to save, who will do anything up to and including being tortured to death to save us, to redeem us, to restore us, to call us back to himself. The judge is the same one who gave his life for our sins. Friends, in final judgment, God is not going to weigh you on some scale to see if you have too much sin or not. And God's not just cherry-picking his favorites and leaving the rest to rot. In final judgment, God is still on the same rescue mission he has been on since the shipwreck of sin. Sin was a shipwreck in the history of the world. And God has been on a mission to save Final judgment is like that final scene in the movie Titanic, if you've seen it, where after the shipwreck, there, there's flotsam and jetsam floating all around, and there are rescue boats going around to see, is there anyone else who's alive? Is there anyone else I can save? Because remember, friends, final judgment, the grace phase, is not about who's been good and who's been bad. It's not. It's not about who is right and who is wrong. It's about who's alive and who's dead. It's not about theology. It's not about morality. Final judgment is about eternal life. Some of you may be new here and you haven't heard me preach on this. Some of you have heard me preach on this and you're going to hear it again. That truly, when Adam and Eve sinned, they died That's what God says. The day that you eat of the fruit, you will die. When Adam and Eve sinned, they were separated from God, the source of life. It's it's like, as I've said before, it's, it's like a rose, a rose stem that has been cut from the vine. It looks the same. It smells the same, but it's dead because it's been cut from the vine, which was its source of life. That rose is dead. In the same way, as soon as Adam and Eve sinned, they were dead separated from God. We humans are all born dead, separated from God. We may look the same just like the rose does, but if we're separated from God, we are dead. Jesus came to offer us life, to offer us eternal life, that we can be grafted back into the vine, into God. Just like you know, a rose that's been cut could be grafted into a living vine and then that rose stem would be alive, we can be grafted back into God. That's why Jesus came. Final judgment is about this eternal life. All of Christianity is about this eternal life. And the way to this eternal life is Jesus. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Jesus came to offer eternal life to those of us who were dead in sin. Final judgment means separating everyone who has life from those who don't. At final judgment, there will not be a theology test to know if you know the right doctrines. There will not be a morality test to know if you've been good or bad. Final judgment The book is not called the book of morality or the book of theology. It's called the book of life. Final judgment is a test of whether or not you are alive, whether you have the eternal life of God within you. Jesus talked about final judgment in John chapter 15, and he says this. He says, abide in me. Whoever abides in me bears much fruit. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. These branches will be gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. The dead branches are not thrown into the fire because they were naughty. The dead branches are not thrown into the fire because they had bad theology. The dead branches are thrown into the fire because they are dead. It's just what you do in spring cleanup in your own yard. Um, The final judgment is taking the dead wood off the vine off the arbor so the vine can thrive. Two weeks ago, another parable. Two weeks ago, Lori preached on on Jesus' parable in Matthew 13 of the wheat and the weeds, right? You guys remember this, right? 
she's sitting here, you have to say yes. <laughs> right, the farmer plants the wheat, and some enemy comes and plants the weeds among the wheat. And the farmer chooses not to send the workers to go pull the weeds yet because they might trample the wheat in the process. But at harvest time, they harvest it all and then separate out the weeds from the wheat. Friends, the point of the parable is not, what if I'm a weed? The point of the parable is God's going to protect his wheat. Not a single weed will be caught in with the wheat. Not any of the wheat will be lost with the weeds. God's going to protect his own. That's the purpose of the parable. Final judgment is the final step when God is restoring the cosmos. St. Augustine, he talked about all of history in four phases. He says first phase was, was Eden. And in Eden, everyone was naturally righteous. We were set right with God, but it was possible to sin. And then we did sin. And suddenly, we were naturally sinners, but it was not possible to be righteous, to be set right with God. And then Jesus came. And through Jesus, it was possible to be set right with God. We're still naturally sinners, sinners by nature, but it's possible to be set right with God. But after final judgment, sin itself will be destroyed. So we will naturally be righteous, and it will not be possible to sin. That's what final judgment is about. It's about eradicating sin, eradicating the damage it has done. As I say in this series booklet, I hope you guys are reading that series booklet. We worked hard on that. That series booklet, I, I talked about if you, if you were restoring a house, imagine you're restoring a house and you discover there's termite damage. We might not have this in Oregon as much as we did in Georgia. Termites are trouble. If there's termite damage, you have to cut out everything that's been damaged by termites and burn it to make sure you get all the termites out. And then you can restore the house. Well, final judgment is God's last pass through to get rid of all of, of sin and all the damage it has done. Hell is the fire that burns it all away. Hell was not created for humans. Hell was created for Satan and his angels. The Bible is clear about that. Sadly, some humans have gotten caught up in Satan's work. But final judgment, sin and the damage it has done will be eradicated so God can restore the cosmos. Now the question so many people want the answer to is, how do I know I'm not a termite? Right? That's the question a lot of people are asking. Can I possibly know today What's going to happen to me at final judgment? And friends, the answer is yes. There, there's a whole big theological word for that. The word is justification. Justification means being set right with God so that we know what happens at final judgment ahead of time. All right? That's what, that's what that means. And John tells us in 1 John 4, what we read today in, in our worship service, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him or God abides in him and he in God. A verse later he says, by this, by, by abiding in God is love perfected in us so we may have confidence on the day of judgment. God doesn't want us to wonder what's going to happen to us on the day of judgment, all right? There's a little bit of surprise, like there's a surprise of what presents you're going to get on Christmas, but there shouldn't be a surprise of whether you get presents on Christmas. God loves us. He's poured out that love in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ offers us eternal life. He died and rose again to offer us eternal life. And if we accept that love, if we accept that sacrifice for ourselves, God adopts us as his children. Final judgment is not a time when God holds up a scale. It's not a time when God's picking cherries. It's a time when God has his, op his arms open in embrace to adopt us, to love us, to call everyone he can to himself. Jesus loved us so much, his arms were nailed in this position, a position of open embrace to welcome us to himself. It is the character and nature of God to save everyone he can. It is truly tragic that not everyone takes God up on that offer. Some people reject that offer, and this is a key point. 
God's love does not mean everybody goes to heaven. There's this book out there, Love Wins, which basically says God loves everybody, so everybody goes to God's eternal kingdom. That is very clearly not what the Bible says because God also cares about justice. God does not look at those human traffickers, does not look at those terrorists and say, oh, those silly people. Let's get real here, friends. It's not fair for a terrorist and an Adolf Hitler and Mother Teresa to have the final, same final reward, is it? We know that. No, but it's not about who's been good and who's been bad. It's about life. It's about whether we have the life of God flowing within us, whether the Spirit of God is flowing within us, whether we are a part of the kingdom of God. Because the truth is, friends, final judgment's about the kingdom. Everything that is part of God's kingdom now will be a part of God's kingdom forever. And everything that is not a part of God's kingdom will simply be burned away. And some people choose to live their lives as part of their own kingdoms instead of a part of God's kingdom. And at final judgment, only God's immortal. Only God is a source of life. By ourselves, we have no life within us. Only death. Now, some of you may be thinking, boy, this sounds a little different from what I've thought of final judgment. And I just have to apologize again for the bad preaching about final judgment for the last several hundred years. It ain't my fault, but sorry. Final judgment's not about who's been good or bad. It's not about who has the right doctrine and who doesn't, who's right or wrong. It's about life, whether we have the eternal life that's offered by Jesus Christ he wants to make that offer to everybody to invite us into the family, to invite us into the kingdom. Now, some of you may be thinking, boy, if that's what final judgment's really about, then a whole lot of people have it wrong. Our whole culture seems to have it wrong. Somebody ought to go tell these people and let them know that this is what final judgment is and that Jesus Christ makes this offer. And that's when God says, yes, go tell people, right? Go tell the world, go make disciples. Submerge them in the reality of the Father, Son, and Spirit. Train them to live as I've trained you to live. That's what we're here for. That's why the church exists. We're the people who have this good news, who are called to live in this good news, who are called to share this good news. Friends, if any of you here today is scared of final judgment, if you've been scared of final judgment, you don't need to be. Final judgment is Christmas. I mean, literally, it's the day of Christ. That's what the New Testament calls it. When goodness will be rewarded, when evil will be brought to justice, when sin will be eradicated, when death itself will be thrown into hell. It's a day when the cosmos will be restored and the kingdom of God will be all that's left forever and we can be a part of it through Jesus Christ. It's good news. Let's live our existence today toward that day. That day of final judgment and the restoration will be the most glorious day in your existence. It'll be the most glorious day in God's existence. Let's live this existence toward that day and inviting others to do the same. Final judgment is good news. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank and praise you that you are a God who cares about justice, that you are a God who rewards goodness, that you are a God who in your perfect love and perfect wisdom have a plan for us, for the restoration of us, for the restoration of the cosmos, and I praise you that we can be a part of it. Help us to live as part of that story. Show us how to invite the world to know this good news too. For we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, through whom it is possible. Amen. In response to God's word, we always have a chance to give back. We'll now bring our tithes and offerings.
Holy God, we offer these gifts to you. Take them and use them to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ with our community and with our world. And God, use us as well. Use us each and every day to share the good news of God's forgiveness, God's grace, God's unconditional love for us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us join together in singing our closing hymn number 303, Christ is Coming. <laughs> is coming to restore the universe, to restore the cosmos. If you have any trepidation about final judgment, he wants you to have that blessed assurance. He wants you to know that you have the eternal life if you put your faith in Jesus Christ. If you've never done that before, Friends, we have a prayer minister over here who would love to speak and pray with you. I would love to speak and pray with you. Don't walk out of here wondering what's going to happen at final judgment. It's supposed to be a day of joy. I'm going to give a benediction, and after that, I realize we have some guests with us. We all join hands to sing the song, uh, We're One in the Bond of Love. It's a beautiful song. The words are in the bulletin, if you don't know it. But friends, go out from this place, and may the love of God surround you. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ give you hope. May the fellowship of the Spirit convince you that final judgment is good news. Amen. Amen.